Hello and welcome to theCUBE here at the New York Stock Exchange. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. This is our inaugural broadcast here on the show floor for Juniper Networks. It's ringing the opening bell. What a great ceremony. And again, kicking off our relationship with the NYSE and the NYSE Wired community. As things go digitally, you start to see things change. You're going to see theCUBE here in New York City a lot and a lot more news to come. Here we have Gene Inglis, CMO of Juniper and Brian Ward, lead network engineer at Dartmouth College, kicking off theCUBE at NYSE. Gene, great to see you. Oh, it's great to see you again, John. So pretty spectacular. Behind us on the floor was a great ceremony, ringing the big bell, everyone's up on there. 15 years celebrating Juniper here, pretty cool. We thought it was a moment to celebrate. And so 15 years of being on the talk exchange, we thought let's bring everyone together, let's host a couple of customers in and, and get deep dives on technology and just celebrate the moment of being here in New York City. Brian, Dartmouth College, you guys doing a lot of innovative things. Obviously the, the innovation is in the DNA of Dartmouth done many interviews with Dartmouth uh, Techs, they're all strong. MIST really is the big story of the Juniper HPE when you add, add in routing all the networking DNA that Juniper has. MIST has been quite the story. Yes. You've been there from day one. Uh, maybe day two. <laughs> we had one customer number one, but we were certainly an early adopter. Um, Dartmouth decided to pick the MIST product and ecosystem before Juniper had even acquired MIST. So we realized the value that MIST brings to the table even before Juniper did. Um, I, I like to say that Dartmouth was probably uh, one of the catalytic moments of the Juniper and MIST partnership. Um, I, I mentioned we picked MIST first, but also that very next day, we also yeah. selected Juniper almost independently to be our switching and routing partner as well. What was the big aha moment and where are we now? How have you seen that trans, uh, trans, tra transformation which missed because it's just got better and better and then the world spun on their doorstep because AI for networking and networking for AI kind of came together like at the flashpoint. Yeah, so the, the AI story that MIST was telling initially, um, being a network engineer, I'll admit, I was skeptical at first, <laughs> but now Marvis, the MIST virtual network assistant, is my first go-to tool whenever I have to log into the system, look at data, dare I say troubleshoot issues, look for problems, try to be proactive. Marvis is really there every step of the way with me now. Yeah, and the scale of data coming in, the telemetry data coming in off the market has been phenomenal. Yes. Just the heavy lifting that the AI does. Can you share your thoughts yeah, on that? It has sped up my time to resolution, my time to design by so much. You know, what well, I could do the job myself in hours. Marvis can do it in seconds. Cool. And to think of having to go back to the old way of doing it, it's not something. We'll come back to what, what the, it looks like going forward. Gene, you've been seeing the benefits from customers. What are other things you're seeing, obviously, with the MIST and Juniper networking happening? Yeah, I mean, I think at Juniper, we believe that every connection counts, but just having connectivity is not really having a great connection. So when you think through the initial, you know, deployment and installation of, of MIST, um, what that means to have a great experience. That was really the forefront of the thinking of you know, AI native networking. Experience first, experiences on the end user, as well as to the operator. Brian, you're kind of a star here at this event, um, you know, going on here in NYSE, being the first CUBE interview and all. The, 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 but there's been obstacles, and you were early adopter. What are some of the obstacles you guys see? We'll start with Brian, you first, Gina, we'll get your, your thoughts, because in networking, the obstacles are there, but AI can help solve them. Yeah, there's there's always obstacles, especially when it comes to IT. If it were simple, I wouldn't have a job, right? Um, and uh, some of the obstacles that we we had encountered prior to MIST were just poor connectivity, poor design, bad user experience, as you were saying. And we, we realized that we needed to completely re-architect our system. We needed to start fresh, clean slate, don't bring any of the legacy, technology into the future. We just need to hit the ground running with something new, something that we know that is going to work for us. And over the years, we've learned to trust it as well. Mm -hmm. Gene, you talked to a lot of customers on the road. You guys have great customer base. What are some of the challenges and adoptions that they've been facing that they now can overcome with AI for networking? I think there's three things. One is that they needed to be a lot simpler, you know, with limited staff and the ability to be able to get ahead of the problems. 
you know, no one's got, no one can be that productive unless they're able to have a virtual network assistant and to be able to get ahead of network issues. Um, and even before they even start. So simplicity and being able to leverage technology, productivity and being able to think about how they get their teams more productive and providing other services. It's not just about Wi-Fi being up. It's actually like what other services can you provide um, to universities or to campuses or branches or any other um, enterprise in the market. Brian, when you started working with Juniper, because you had missed in Juniper, when did you start to trust that this was all going to work out? When did you see it kind of come together? We were we were hesitant at first when we heard about the Juniper acquisition, but our experience with both companies independently of each other was so good that we didn't really have any any worry or any doubt about that that initial acquisition. Um, since then, we started with Mist in 2018. Over the past few years, we've realized that that partnership has really been able to evolve the Mist product, the ecosystem, the AI into a really groundbreaking technology that we, we leverage every day. It runs our campus. It, it runs everything for us on the network. We'll go into some of the things that, that you saw uh, on the horizon you might have anticipated. Like for example, data comes in, configurations, uh, network uh, challenges. You're seeing a lot of people that might not know AI, right? So if you look at like, there's a lot of misconceptions. Certainly there's a hype cycle going on right now, and it's clear language models are working, but there's a ton of work going on in the infrastructure layer right now. It's huge. Compute, storage, and networking. The three major building blocks, we've seen this movie before in other, other generations, but now it's a whole nother generation. What are some of the misconceptions that you guys see uh, on AI? Yeah, so the, you hear about AI in the news, and it's all yeah. you know large language models, generating text, creating content creating false content a lot of times. And the Marvis AI is a different class of technology. It's there, think more like big data, you know, the, the trend from just a few years ago. The Marvis AI is about taking all this data that's been captured, all of these real world scenarios, real customer problems, and analyzing it to come up with real actionable items. Yeah, really I, think there's, I do think there's a misconception, I mean, I. I don't think you can just bolt on AI. Like you actually have to do it from the ground up. And what was the, the benefit is having seven years of having all that data, telemetry, correlations, and then yes, the right infrastructure, which means that sure, it's on your APs or access points, it's on your devices, it's on your OS, it's your software, it's a cloud native architecture. You got to get data real time. Um, and what we see from customers is, is that when they think cloud native and AI native, that they see real results. You know, Gene, we had Raj for CTO Juniper on our AI Silicon Valley Infrastructure Leader Series uh, with the NYC Wired community, and you know, there was so many conversations. I want to get your reaction to one that I thought was compelling. And uh, Brian, if you don't mind weighing in too, um, the person said, "Oh, training is like going to school. You go from grade one and you get trained, and then you and then you infer." Mm -hmm. And so, with the with the thinking was inference. So there's a lot of setup involved in in, in AI, and at the networking layer, that's essentially the network and all the data configurations, but then this inference wave is coming. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing more data, so actually reinforced learning. So you're seeing a lot more of this neural network, human um, value, where the humans are in charge. So you can't just let AI do it, you got to drive it. So the, the metaphor was, like school, you learn, that's your AI, and then inference are mechanisms, but it's the human in the loop. It's human in what, the what's loop. What's your reaction sure. to that, that metaphor? I think it's a true statement. I mean, we talk about you know AI for networking and networking for AI. And in any case, there's a human in the loop. Um, being able to understand and how you can operate, deploy easier, the simplicity that it brings, but you still have, the humans are creative. Like we're trying to figure out what problems to solve. The AI helps us to do that faster. Then you think about what do you do to actually like have networking for AI? Yes, like the ability to have the power, the ease of deployment, even using current architectures where you don't want to rip and replace what you have, especially if they're Ethernet based, but you can go in and you can start to think about how you give AI a value add to your company. Yeah, I see the Marvis AI as an assistant, not as a replacement. Yeah. There will always be work for me to do today, tomorrow, far into the future, for hopefully. Um, <laughs> and, and, and you know, Marvis is working around the clock. I get to go home at night. It's continuing to monitor my network, look for yeah. trouble areas, make suggestions on how to better optimize and catch problems before they impact. I mean, you're a network engineer. We want to have a great network, running smoothly, water's flow through the pipe, so to speak, but ultimately the productivity gains. And again, that's going to be the key thing. Um, and I think that's, a, that's something that kind of is a soft benefit 
but it's valuable. Well, when it's 90% fair trouble tickets, it's a lot of value. Now that's value. Again, the data, how important is the data? And, and what does the future of network engineering look like as the AI comes in to augment the human intelligence? Like, I forget who said the quote, but having a single real measurement is better than having thousand opinions. Might have to look that up to <laughs> achieve it. Um, and, and as an engineer, that's something that I really take to heart. Um, Whenever somebody comes to me with a problem, oh no, the Wi-Fi's out, the internet's broken. Okay, can we be a little more specific? What building? Who are you? Where are you? When did this start? This is all data that NIST is capturing round the clock. So it's able to detect and point at these problems or even identify that yeah. there isn't a problem. You know, Marvis Minis is constantly running on the network, proactively testing my services for me. So that way, when it detects an issue, it alerts me before my users do. Yeah, and that's frees you up to do, your aperture increases as an engineer. You can do so much more. It's awesome. We see a lot of universities right now looking at how do they provide digital services back yeah. to the administration, the faculty, students, even researchers. And once they don't have the trouble tickets and having to do the maintenance of the everyday, they start to think about how do you actually impact sustainability on campus? How do you impact student wellness on campus? Yeah. And, and those are services that the team had not thought about before, but because of the time or productivity that they save, they're actually able to add more value add back to the university. You know, I love the Dartmouth store. I love the higher red end because they actually have the word campus actually means campus and campus networking. It is the college. Because <laughs> <laughs> the college is campus. But campus networking has uh, been a big part of networking. And you know, the history of Juniper has been all about networking and campus. But now with wireless, Wireless is changing, you've got more blanket covers, more spectrum, Wi-Fi 7's around the corner, the specs are getting faster, it's ethernet in the air. Brian, what's, what's next for Dartmouth? How do you see your engineering vision with Dartmouth with, as wireless expands, as more faster connectivity, backhauling? I, I've seen it change already just in the past seven years. Um, Wi-Fi is a must-have utility. There is no student on my campus today that has lived in a world without Wi-Fi. That's mind blowing to me. I remember the before Wi-Fi turned it. I'm sure you do. You know yeah, the so meme is it's, in the, it's below food and shelter in the Maslow's hierarchy of so needs. So actually, <laughs> on that comment, um, we we actually kind of did an, an informal survey of students. Would you rather shut off Wi-Fi or water for a week? Shut off the water. <laughs> <laughs> they got Starbucks right on the corner. I can yeah. order a bottle of water. Yeah, no, it's 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 a, it's a <laughs> utility right. need. And again, remember the days, but pre-Wi-Fi, you know, there was we were we were there. So like this is. This is the utility, again, I can't emphasize how much we hear that AI, generative AI right now, is the networking is one of the most important things. The silicon, the connectivity around it, ethernet, the systems, it's like a server now, these machines. They're like nice. clustered systems. Look what, They're clusters. I mean, it's a software game. Yeah, um, we have an ops for AI lab we just opened up. And basically you can come in and simulate to your environment to look at AI training and inference models. So the ability yeah. to like bring people in, test it out, um, it makes it so it's not a, a surprise and trying to create it on your own. I took a visit to so you got a lot of GPUs in there. We do. I know where the stockpile <laughs> <do>. is. <laughs> Brian, what's next for you guys? What's for, what for you? What's on your journey? Give us a little taste of what's, what your life's like. So obviously we'll be keeping up to date with the newest, greatest technology. You know, Wi-Fi 6E is current. Wi-Fi 7 is being talked about widely in the industry. But what I would like to do is start to more better empower my my staff, my help desk staff, and my end users. Mm -hmm. If I can take the troubleshooting out of my hands, give it to a junior engineer, give it to the first line, you know, customer service representative, even make it self-service. You know, the, the students these days, they are familiar with going online and researching solutions. They're college students, they know how to research. If they can get their issue resolved or get guidance on how to resolve it themselves without having to pick up the phone, God forbid, pick, making a phone call, yeah. or dealing with some arcane ticketing system, that's that's where I see the next step. I think phone calls, they don't even call anymore. I think they don't, they just text. They auto text, voice act, call. <laughs> Gee, great to have you on. Good oh, to see you. Congratulations you. on the success of Juniper and with HPE on the horizon. Yes. A lot of good stuff. And of course, behind us, we got the NYSC. This is the inaugural CUBE interview. You For guys are in beyond. history lore of the CUBE. <laughs> Brian, status oh, is you. top of the notch. Gee, thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you so much, John. Okay, this is the CUBE coverage. We are here in New York City on the show floor of the New York Stock Exchange part of our ever-expanding ecosystem and community, partnering with the NYSE Wired community. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.